I think we want to start with the significance of black culture in your work. And for me personally, I'm born and raised from the DMV. I don't know if I have any of that in the room. Born and raised in a DMV. I know what it means to be influenced by where I'm from and very much how DC interjects itself into everything that I do, whether it's the music I listen to, the clothes that I wear. Streetwear was a big thing in DC, so that was something that definitely was like a huge influence for me. So for the both of you, being from, you know, places that have very specific cultures, you know, being from Chicago, being born in California, but then ultimately moving to Mississippi and being in the South and those two culture differences, I would really love to know from you two how those places shape your perspective today. I mean, I think for me, it was really interesting because like she said, I was born in California and I moved to Mississippi when I was 13. So there wasn't a lot of fashion there at all. So I think it created this drive in me to really go out and see the world and explore other places. So it put me in a position to where I studied fashion a lot because I didn't have, you know, access to it there. You know, I would go into like my friends' closets. Actually, one of my friends is here now. Her name is Zakia, but I would go in Zakia's closet and like style out of her closet because there were no showrooms or there there was nothing accessible to us in Jackson. So I feel like in a way it did shape and motivate me to get the fuck out of there <laughs> and go see the world and see other places. So I do think that it definitely played a huge part. Yeah. Amazing. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Before I start, let the church say amen. amen. It's Sunday, so we got to start there. Um, for me, I was raised in Chicago, so you had two cultures, right? You had church culture, and then you also had street pimp culture, right? So um, that's what I grew up seeing, you know, um, for us, you know, our high class and who we wanted to be like and emulate was like the drug dealers and the pimps, you know? So um, there's a term that comes from that tech, that, um, that lifestyle called peacocking, right? And it's, so it's, it's about putting on your best so that you can draw attention to yourself no matter what, what your economic status is, how much money you got, you wanna put on your best all the time. And so I think that carried through into my work. Um, and so my work became, I think, in my career very polarizing. You know, you either really love it or you really don't, but the one thing that I always wanted to do is make you talk about it. Um, so, and just, you know, adding all those things. And then my love for women, you know, um, Y'all could clap for that. <laughs> That's all right. You know, I, I really believe that being a woman is an art form, and um, just watching everything that a woman has to do just to just to put herself together to walk into the world. So the, it's a combination of all those things that that really fueled me um, in my work and in my career. Amazing. You jumping ahead a few steps because we're gonna get on black women in a second. You already know. Yeah. Because you both have styled some icons, amazing black women icons who have become your muses in so many different ways. And so we're gonna get there, but I got a couple more things I wanna get to before. Um, who's your, your personal childhood fashion icon? I'll give you mine first. Okay. It was Lil' Kim. It was Lil' Kim. And, we could clap for that too. Yeah. It was Lil' Kim. From going, you know, to being ridiculed at her peak for the style that she had and how bold she was to her colorful wigs or her risque looks, you know, to the girls are copying her now and you're seeing it be commended in a way that it wasn't when she was doing it. And that's the case for so many of those people that we really loved coming up. And so I would really love to hear from y'all, your childhood fashion icon. I think being the first, you always gotta take the hit. Yeah. Um, and. For me, I was definitely inspired by Kim. Yeah. And every time I see her, I, I clam up like a little boy. I, I mean, every time I see her, I just, you know, um, because again, being from the hood, it's like, that was the glamour. Literally. Right, that's the first time her you and Foxy- You saw yourself in her. Right, her and Foxy introduced us to Dior and- Absolutely. You know what I mean, like, and we quoted those lines and we went out and back in the day, you know, she used to be a booster, and you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. whatever Kim said, I had to get it one way or another. Absolutely. Um, but, and then once I started learning about, oh, we gonna tell the truth, we, we around our people. Listen. Is this a safe environment or not? Nah? 
right? You know we gonna tell the truth. Do. We okay. we we done been through some things. We done, we done came. You know, we in a different we place now. Off. But you know, whatever Kim said, we not fighting in the club no more, law. <laughs> I mean, shit. I'm gonna be honest. I'm with my people. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then you know, for me, then it became people like Grace Jones, who you know is on everybody's mood board when you when you start thinking about fashion risk takers and um, Naomi, um, of course. But yeah, it's, for me, it's always been it's always been black women. It's always been black women. Amazing, Colin. Yeah, I think I would agree. I would say Kim, but on a personal level, I would say my sister. I feel I like I grew that. up watching her get ready every day, watch her, you know, we went to the same high school for I think a year or two, and I just remember admiring her style. I'll never forget, there was like one year, I'm not gonna say what year it was, but there was a year, <laughs> I think it was my freshman year in high school, and she had on like a baby fat, and I know that this is late now, but she had on like a baby fat cat suit, and she had on some Air Force One heels. And I just remember then thinking, I know that that's wild. I'll fix y'all faces. Nah, I see nah. y'all faces like, wait, exactly like what Air Force One gave. heels. Yeah, yeah, I said it. Yeah. But um, I just remember thinking like she was just the baddest woman on earth, the baddest girl on earth. So yeah, I, was, I would have to say my sister. I grew up watching her and everything that she did. I love that. Those are amazing examples. Um, was there a like a universal, universal, sorry, cultural moment that was really impactful for you to see growing up that you really saw yourself in. For me, it was BET's Rip the Runway. You know, that Mark Pose in fashion show that Pharrell and NERD performed at, it was crazy for me. I was like, well, shit, we can do that. Maybe I can do that. You know, like it made me feel like I could do it too. Pun intended on Pharrell, you know. My nigga, you could do it too. Y'all got it? Okay, all right, just making sure. Um, and so um, I want to know, did y'all have moments like that where you saw something and it, and it kind of sparked something in you at a young age where you like, I really do see myself in this now? I think the same. Um, I mean, hip hop in the 90s, early 2000s was uh, revolutionary, right? Even if we think about um, the transformation of denim, you know, we can trace denim all the way back to slavery and when we see our ancestors on the slave, they still had a sense of style, and denim was such an important part of that. Absolutely. And then denim transitioned into, um, into the marches. Uh, Martin Luther King actually marched in a Wranglers denim outfit when he was uh, uh, marching for workers' equality. And then the way 90s came around and took this, this, this fabric that was known as workwear and then became luxury. Um, and for us to see that transition and then to live it in the 90s and the early 2000s was really instrumental to me and, and aspirational for me. Um, but that's just a testament of us as black people. We always can take, even from our food, we could take what people look at as scraps and, and, and throw it away and make something amazing out of it. And the early 90s, I mean, late 90s, early 2000s, and seeing that, and just the way that hip hop started to infiltrate, um, you know, high fashion, and then we can, you know, Misa and June, we always got to get them their flowers because they were instrumental in introducing that culture to us. Amazing. Colin? I would say BET as a whole. I just remember being at school and instead of focusing on what I was supposed to be focusing on, <laughs> I was ready to get home and to go watch 106 in Park. Yeah. You know, music videos. We wanted to see know. what Free was wearing that Yeah, week. I wanted to see what Free was wearing. I wanted <laughs> to see what all the guests were wearing in the music videos. And I think that's why, even now to this day, like music videos are one of my strong points because as a child, I used to study and watch them over and over and over again. So I would say BT, hip hop culture as a whole, yeah. This, this really like brings us full circle to a point we'll get to and just like the work that you're doing now, considering that you do do a lot of work with musicians and artists and how like you spent all this time observing and learning and watching and now getting to implement style for them and build how they show up in the world. I think it's just so amazing for the two of y'all, but we're gonna get to it. Um, we've already kind of talked about this, so I'm not gonna lean too heavy on this question, but I think overall like, I, your perspective on how black culture influences fashion as a whole and the overall recognition of women, how we've seen and gone from what we've already talked about, where we've 
been ridiculed in the past, but now you have, you know, Cardi B and uh, the face of Marc Jacobs and Meg being a cover girl and seeing these women now being positioned at the forefront. It feels like we have moved leaps and bounds, but I'm sure that there's so much more to do. And I would be really curious to know, like, how much more do you feel like is ahead? How much more, you know, do we deserve that we're not still getting, that we're not even aware of necessarily? I mean, I think, I think it's so much more. I do think that we've come far, but I don't think there is a ceiling, you know? I think that it's so much further to go. I think that we have broken a lot of barriers and reached milestones, but I think that it's almost like a never-ending, you know, work in progress. Yeah. Because you see a lot of people being inclusive, but, you know, I feel like a lot of people or brands or companies do it for the look versus it being genuine. Exactly. You know, and so they won't get backlash. So I think that we have come far, but I just, I feel like it's so much further to go. You know, sky's the limit, so. Fair. Yeah. Um, we all know that black people can sell luxury, right? Mm -hmm. But what the difference is, is the ownership. Right, and it's it's okay to become the face of something, but it needs to the the shift needs to become not only the face but also have equity. And Absolutely. so the deals that I'm a part of now with my clients, we we're coming in and we yeah we don't want we don't want a licensing deal. We don't want it just to be the face of something. We're looking for a long term partnership that includes equity, and that's the changes. Because it's, I mean yeah, it's glamorous. It's it's amazing to to see to see our artists front campaigns, but mm -hmm. it's like, after those deals are done, which usually is a year or two, then what next, you know? And, and that's the difference between something looking good and being good. Yeah, and it's, it's just, and you know, and you've, you've made, the, you know, in most deals, they make a, a few million dollars or whatever, but just think of the hundreds of millions. That the company that makes. That the company is making. So that part hasn't changed at all. And we saw that in the 90s with, you know, with all the brands that were just, having ra rappers front their brands and they were just giving them clothes back then yeah you know what i mean so it's like yeah it feels like we've come so far but in actuality we really haven't i feel like that's an issue across industries to be honest and how you know sometimes i feel like there's these conversations that get had about black women who start to create their own brands like we see sacred out here or fenty beauty and there's a reason for that it's because they don't want to be the muse and the and the horse for somebody else's brand and how they make their money they it would make more sense for us to build our own and support those brands um that kind of jumps to another question that i that i really I'm excited to talk about because it's a legacy building element, but I don't want to jump ahead because these are kind of like building all into those different narratives that we want to get to because legacy and business go hand in hand. And when we think about these brands that exist for 50 years, 100 years, a lot of these luxury brands that we love to wear and spend our money on, none of them are black. Few of them are black that have been able to exist in such longevity in the way that these luxury houses do and ultimately like we want to see the brands today that we love and support that are talented and amazing here you know for longer periods of time not just the louis batons of the world and as much as we love louis i mean he's there we love that um we need black people to own our things um okay and so give it up for that one time <laughs> um looking at the both of you today Everyone recognizes the trailblazers you are now, but obviously this took years of work, of trials and errors, and things that you have done that build you up to where you are now. This was not something that happened overnight, as much as someone may think that, someone may perceive it that way, because you just don't know, you wasn't there. Um, I really would love for you guys to share an impactful experience that happened to you that really was something that gave clarity in your, toward your becoming the amazing creatives, professionals, stylists, architects that you are now? Well, I think it's a, um, we share someone in common. There's a woman in a room that was very instrumental in the beginning of my career and also the beginning of Colin's career that I don't think that a lot of people knows about. So I wanna be able to give her her flowers right now, Tam. Tamara Taylor from Mastermind ooh, ooh, ooh. Management. Stand up, um, stand up. Don't be shy. Go ahead and stand up. Give it up for her. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, we we actually met on a on a. I'll, I'll tell the story because I love telling stories. So I was I was be, in the beginning of my career. I was still taking Southwest 
I was on the Southwest flight, um, high, and I didn't want nobody sitting next to me. And I was working, I had just started working with K. Michelle, and um, I had made all this money, but I didn't understand the financial part of it. And I'm a manifester, and so I just kept on saying to the universe, send me someone who, who doesn't want to be famous, who doesn't care about fashion, who understands numbers and business. And I saw her walking down the aisle, and I kind of put my head down, and the universe made it so that it was the only seat left. So we had to sit next to each other. So we said our hellos, and, um, and so we started talking. She said, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a stylist. She's like, oh, she didn't really know what that was. And I was like, oh, I work with Kay Michelle. She's like, oh, I love her, whatever. And I said, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm the operations manager for 24 Burger Kings in California, but I just lost my job. And I literally reached out, grabbed her hand. I said, we're going to get rich together. And she came in. And so she, <laughs> funny part of the story, she called me. I gave her my social security number, my bank accounts. I'm like, we work together. We together. We and go she, together. We go together real bad. <laughs> And um, she was really instrumental in the beginning of my career. And because we learned together, she had no structure. So she was doing deals like she did a deal. I won't say who the artist was, but literally I was making like, you want to say the number? <laughs> I, she did a deal just because just because of hustle and being from Chicago. She did a deal where I, when I, I was making $90,000 a month on retainer. More money I have ever saw in my life. And Period. this young black girl with no experience that I met on a Southwest flight had the courage to, to see that. the value in me and to ask for it. And she changed my life. And in turn, we changed each other's lives. And I introduced her to Colin and she was, you know, instrumental in early in the early days of his career. And um, and so it's 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 that it's that it's, it all ties back to black women. It all turns back to that because I've worked with agents past that and nobody has had the courage to do the things that she's done for me because she sees the value in me, right? Because she knows where I come from and we have like experiences. And so she really changed my life and, and changed my, the trajectory of my career and the trajectory of my bank account. Period. Thank Period. You. And I love you, Tam. <laughs> Shout out to Tam. <laughs> No, yeah, I would have to say definitely Tam has played a huge role. But even earlier than that, I would have to give it to my friend Zakia, my best friend that's sitting right here. I think that I was living in Mississippi and we actually met working at Olive Garden. I was a bus boy. I think I was like 17. I think we were like 17, 18. I was a bus boy. She was a server. And we just, we clicked, and then we grew to be really, really close. She moved to Atlanta. I moved to Atlanta with her for a little bit, and I was sleeping on her floor, getting bit up by spiders, but that's another conversation. But I remember having a dream, and she really invested in me. Like, I remember wanting to go to New York Fashion Week and not having anything. Like, we were both struggling, sleeping on the floor, and she would, you know, she was, she was working. I was looking for work, but she would pay for my bus tickets, my Chinatown bus tickets to go to New York. So I would take the Chinatown bus to go to New York to get that experience, to experience Fashion Week and to go out there and network. You know, she would help me with my business cards. I would go out there and think I was doing my big one with my portfolio and my business cards, passing them out. But um, I would say she was, she was the one that invested in me and played a really, really huge role in where I am, where I am today, yeah. Give it up for that. Shout out to Zakia. So it sounds like for the up, both of you, you a really impactful moment was finding someone who believed in you enough to push you towards the next thing, to help you towards the next thing. Um, and so, that's a, that's a massive thing, I think, when you're trying to figure yourself out at an early stage. And I think that's a great segue into this next question because um, as professionals in fashion, as stylists, what were the steps that you took early on to ensure that your work was distinctive before you ever had a big name client? What, what did your work look and feel like? I think for me, I've always, like, even my first, my first introduction to fashion was, like I said, music videos, but then after that it was editorial. So I think I really, really studied editorial, and before I ever thought that I would ever work with any celebrity, 
it was always editorial. So I had a dream of being a stylist that styled the cover of magazine, celebrity or not. So I think with my success, I still carried that over. Um, like even, even with Cardi, you know, she's a female rapper and I know that when people think female rapper, they immediately make up in their head what, you know, what one should look like. But I think when we first started, a lot that got, uh, what got us a lot of attention is that she was kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Like she was wearing full suiting, she was covered, you know, and of course, later on down the line, we had a lot of naked moments, but I felt like taking a new angle with someone who everybody thinks is supposed to be boxed in or look a certain way is what really is what really got me my recognition in fashion. So I think when people seen her, people were familiar with her at first, but when people seen that she switched stylists and seen what she was wearing, it kind of made people go and research like, damn, I wonder who's I wonder who's dressing her. So I think that's what kind of set me aside. And and before you got to Cardi, the types of clients you had looked like what? Um, nothing. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I love all my past clients. Um, it was really models. Like I was okay. really styling models. Um, I was a contributing fashion editor for Elle Indonesia, so okay. it was a lot. It was just a lot of models, a lot of editorial, and then of course I worked with Law. Yes. Um, and assisted him with Zendaya. So that was like my first experience on the celebrity side um, in that capacity. But I never had, uh, no one could have ever prepared me for a Cardi, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is a great segue, unless you want to answer that no, question. No, no, I think he's this is a great, a great segue job. because Law, I know you've been a mentor to yeah. Colin. And yeah. so can you talk about your relationship a little bit and what you saw in him and made you believe in his potential? Um Ooh. Ooh. Colin Colin was one of my very first assistants, but Colin always had an incredible sense of style. And um his work ethic wasn't all that great at first. <laughs> and we used to get into it about that. But the talent was there, right? And sometimes you the, the the work ethic and the business savvy can be learned, but the style is instinctual. You're born with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, me and Kyla, we done been through some shit. Like, Kyla tried to fight me one night. Oh, God. <laughs> he tried it. I, mean, I need to know what it was about. What happened? <laughs> no, Real quick. I mean, we, oh, no, we we're not, we're not go going into that. that. No, what but, no, no, but the thing about that, the Give thing about dream. that, when we talk about that and all the things that we've been through, love isn't perfect. Absolutely. Love isn't perfect. And, you know, and every time we, we have our falling outs, we always come back and it's like nothing ever happened because we genuinely love each other and I genuinely I always pray for him to be as successful as possible um, because that, that I think of all the people that I've that worked with me, that I've mentored as part of my legacy and my children. And you know, whether we fall out and we don't talk to each other for six months, if he calls me and he needs anything, he knows I'm gonna be there and vice versa. And, and the fighting and the arguing and the disagreement, that's just love. That's what families do. Absolutely. I think mentorship, yes, give it up for that, please. Please, please give it up for that because there are few people that you'll have authentic connections with. And so whenever you see two people that have been able to lock in and support each other who are both rising, it's, it's rare and it's to be appreciated. And I think mentorship is something that like, everyone doesn't necessarily understand how those relationships should operate. And of course, there'll be moments of growth where like you're each changing, but you ultimately yeah. grow together he, in the same direction. He wasn't born to be nobody's assistant. Uh, I definitely of course. <laughs> but, but he was born to be in relationship with you. Yeah, and so how, how mentorship, I think oftentimes like grows is that eventually you go from this dynamic that feels like a subordinate versus like someone that you brought up to be a peer yeah. because that is the best form of mentorship. It's like, if I'm doing my job well, you should be up too, Yeah, you know? And so I think like how we figure out how to navigate mentorship at this big age, you know, if you're changing careers, if you're trying to figure out your next step, I think it's really important when you find someone that's willing to, that can see your potential yeah. and then willing to invest in you and take you along. And so I just commend the two of you for being able to do that and Thank navigating you. all the challenges that come with that because it's rare and it's beautiful and we appreciate it. So give it up for that one time, yeah. please. Thank you. Um, Cause you know, you, you can go, what's the, what's the proverb? You know, you can go fast alone, but you go further together. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so this question I think is important because as you become more successful and maybe more solidified in the work that you do, it can be easy to stop being a student. And I think the best creatives remain that way. They remain open to learning. They remain open to innovation. They're the ones that stand the test of time. They don't become married to a thing. So I would really love to know how the two of you really um, still engage with learning for yourself no, and school, developing for school yourself. School is open every day for me. What does it give? School is open every day. What does it give? I, is it YouTube <laughs> University? What's it's it give? No, it's everything. It's, <laughs> it's, it's watching, it's learning, it's, it's going beyond the scope of what you think you are an expert in because um, cause there's a through line in between, a through line in being a good business person and elevating in business and diversifying business, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm a student of the game, fashion and otherwise. Like I, I, I try to learn something new every single day. Because if you don't, then you become complacent, you know? And then you also wanna learn something new about yourself every day. It took me um, to retire and to step away from a huge career for a minute to actually figure out that I didn't really even know who I was outside of it, right? I had to really grieve the death of my career and then almost be reborn to understand how to really love myself and to be happy because everything, all my happiness and joys was, was tied into my work. Can we talk about that for a second? Because, and, and listen, stop me if this is too tough because I know part of the reason you were frustrated with the industry was how they were treating you and the fact that you had a significant loss in your family and no one was giving you space to really acknowledge that loss because the reality is everything can look good, we do all this glamorous shit, yeah. but then you still have to go home at the end of the day, yeah. you know, to yourself, to your family and things that look good aren't necessarily that good yeah and it was, so it was like no matter how how big i got no matter how many awards i got no no matter how i changed people's lives and and uh, people the way people perceive them it was never enough and then i also just got tired of being you know compared to mediocre white women uh, which was Period. the biggest thing you Period. know what i mean it's just like i just needed a break i'm you know it's like oh i'm all these things but i still have to get on the phone and plead my case and, and, and appease you. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. I felt like I had got to a place where I just didn't need it. Right. I didn't need it anymore. I had, I had done it all, in my opinion. Now, finding happiness and my own joy, now I get to say yes to the things that I want to say yes to and say no to the things that I don't want to do. And now my no's are way more powerful than my yeses. Thank you for that, Lon. Going back to the question, Colin, it was how do you still engage in learning and developing right now? Whether that's what your day-to-day -day looks like or there's tools that you use, anything. I think I really made the conscious effort to just remove all ego when I show up in spaces. I feel like once you remove ego, you really create an opportunity to continue to learn. You know, I think a lot of us focus on being the best in the room, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think we should all aspire to be that. But I think there's also rooms with people who are better, who know more, and who you can learn from. So I think when, once you remove that ego and understand that you're a student until the day you die, then I feel like that keeps the opportunity open to continue to learn, you know? Agreed, agreed. I'll make one recommendation to this room and anyone that like, maybe is trying to figure out where their priorities should be creatively. And it's a recommendation I love to give people. There's a book. It's called Art Slash Work. And the book is interesting because it focuses honestly on fine artists who want to be in like galleries and shit. Like that if you want to, if you're a painter or something. But it was written by a lawyer and a gallerist who got tons of questions from their creative qu friends about how they get into certain spaces. And a lot, the first few chapters are just about you as a creative, and they apply to everyone in my opinion. And so I think if you're, it helps kind of ground why you're doing what you're doing and how you even orient your work if it's personal. Everyone's work isn't, but I feel like creative work is. You know, it's part of you, it's an extension of you. And so like, if it's something that you really need to calibrate as far as your values are concerned because the industry can really play with you, and that's really what we're talking about is like how you keep yourself grounded and you maintain your personal values 
values, morals, and what you're trying to do versus what everybody else wants you to do and want from you. And that book really did help orient me personally. I was like, oh, girl, I thought I knew, but I didn't. And this really helped kind of like extract some things where you understand what you're working towards for yourself first. So that's my one little piece of ta tangible advice to people in the room. That book might give you a little bit of perspective on like where to start. But moving into like the business and brand of it all, um, because I think that there's a lot to styling that people don't understand. I think people think it's all fun and games, you know, like you you pop into your closet and, and it's and it's fun. This shit is stressful. <laughs> it's stressful, especially when you're doing it at a high level and when you're not dressing yourself. I've seen stylists who really had, and I'm not gonna name nobody, but you know who become famous for dressing people like the way they dress. <laughs> Name them, call no, them out, let's I'm call them out. Do it. Don't, don't drag funny. me, okay? I'm, I'm not, don't get me in trouble. But you know what I mean? And so it's like, it really is a skill to look at someone and understand what fits them. And so I really am curious to know, you know, the elements that you consider when you're dressing someone and how you differentiate for each one of those individuals. Um, because I know it can be a challenge, especially considering the big personalities. So anybody want to start that question? I think, I think for me, um, over time, you build a chemistry with these, with these women that you work with, you know, and you begin to see what they like, what they don't, what you like versus what they like. And you come to some type of common ground, you know, to what works for everybody. I think that I don't really have, I don't feel like I have too big of an issue separating um, because all of my girls are so different. And there's, you know, there may be one, one piece that I'll put one girl in that I would never put the other in. Um, even like, you know, all of my girls have different body types. So I feel like that's, not, that's never really been a challenge. Um, and it's always feedback that I get too that like, wow, you really make all of your girls look so different but my vision for each one of them are just is just completely different. So yeah. Amazing. I've never had that problem. <laughs> Period. <laughs> and so um <laughs> Holy shit, it's the truth. <laughs> and so when you think about um the massive moments that you have styled these women for it, Zendaya's Mugler, robot look, eight. Okay, Cardi's Four piece Matt Gala series of looks. Y'all, that was a series. She needed like episodes, honey. They needed to do a series on that girl because there were so many looks. We weren't ready. How do you approach um, moments like those? What does the team look like? Is it just you? Because oftentimes you're not just dealing, styling that one person. You know, it's like you might have a, a person who we know is your priority, but I've seen, I was like, oh damn, that was Law too. That was Colin too. I thought it was just. No, and so now it gets into team and structure and planning, you know, because I don't think people realize the months, you know, as soon as the Met gets announced in the beginning of the year, it's like, oh yeah, we planning for that. And so what does that look like? Well, I mean, my, my last moments all happened after my retirement and it was, um, I really just, I did a lot of it on my own. Like I, I went down from a staff of eight to just one. Um, so, so, so my work is a lot Lord, different. Why are you fucking lying? No, my, my work is a lot different. But um, I think <laughs> it's funny because when people think about my work, they always just think about um, Zendaya and Celine Dion. But I've, I've dressed so many people, like, you know, as far as like Ariana Grande, like Sweetener, that whole album was me. Dangerous Woman, that whole album was me. All the videos, the tours. Um, you know, Hunter Schaefer. Like, I've always had you know, 10, 12 clients at a time, but I just think that what I'm more, what synony me and Zendaya and our relationship is just so synonymous that that's what people um, know and love me for the most, but I've always had a really big business. Like, the year before I retired, I had 13 people at the Met Gala. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, but so, so no, now my work is different. Now my work is more... Um, it's not about volume. No, it's, it's not about volume, but it's about... Intentionality. Yeah, exactly, and 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 showing up for for this girl, this woman, and dad who's shown up for me my entire career. So I don't, I, you know, my my whole everything is different. I'm so like, 
I feel so light and airy and easy. Which we're so happy for you in that because you deserve that after so much work yeah. being put in. I think that when people see the volume of work when you were doing loads of stuff, they just want to understand like how, you yeah. know, how did you do that? And just knowing that like there were times where like, like right now it is just you I and tell you, you prefer truth, it that uh, way. I'm just going to be very honest. The reason I worked the way I did is because I never wanted to go to bed hungry again. Period. And when you grow up a certain type of way, absolutely, you're gonna see every opportunity as your last opportunity. So I never felt like I can say no. Could never say no. Right, and so it was, you know, you, it's just you work, you work, you work, you work, you work, and then it takes you, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that's wrong at all, because you have to have, you have to have the ground before you have the glory. Mm -hmm. You have to, right, and so, you know, I did everything in my power so that I could live a certain type of lifestyle. So I neglected, um, I, I neglected so many things over the years. It's a, it's a a, 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 a part of my book that I write about that that kind of when I was writing a book and it's called How to Build a Fashion Icon: Notes on Confidence from the World's Only Amish Arch Image Architect. And you can pre-order it on um, yes. Amazon right now if you want to. Thank you so much. But there was this one so. One of my uncles died, and his daughter called me, and she was planning a funeral. And she said, "Okay, we got the date for the funeral. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be Friday, you know, whatever." And you know, because I was working, I was so selfish. I said, "Can we move? Can we move it to Sunday?" Like I was so selfish and so just into myself and what I had going on that I asked my cousin who was grieving the death of her father to move the funeral to accommodate me, right? And it's, and it's like, you, you get so caught up in, in chasing success, which is nothing Real wrong quick, with Law, that. Real quick, Law, did you catch that or did the family be like, you're tripping? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that I did it until I started writing the book and I was going through my memories and talking about it. And I was like, how hurtful was that to, to her, you know? But but when you when you grind it, it's like you you so laser focused on on getting to a certain place, and I wanted to be bigger and better than everybody else. Absolutely, you know what I mean. So, and and, and it's a double edged sword, right? Because you do want to have that hustle, but then you also do want to you do like I've done so many things I can't even, I can remember barely remember any of it. Can I say this though, Law? Sure. I think that. I understand exactly how you mean. I come from an upbringing that was definitely, you know, not soft. You know, I experienced two years of homelessness with my mom, and it was something that really instilled a similar grind of why I go as hard as I do. And so I get that. I think what you did, though, created a foundation for everything in the way that you're able to operate at this point that you otherwise might not have had. So as much as like there were lessons to be learned, thank God you learned them because so many people move that way and they never catch it for themselves. And you're still operating in a place of so much ego and pride and self-centeredness, but you were like, uh, 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 let's strip that. I'm not doing that. I actually care about my family more than any of this shit. And so let's figure out a way to balance it. And so one, I want everyone to give a round of applause for that because it's like, everybody Everybody doesn't get there. And the fact that you were able to extract it took a yourself while. It took a while and get there. I wanted, I wanted to, was therapy me, involved, Law? Uh, therapy? Did that happen? No, I, th I, I therapeutic myself. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's just like when I came to Hollywood, like I wanted to be better than the white women. You know what I mean? Like I wanted my name to be included in those conversations. I wanted to be on the cover of those magazines. I wanted to be number one on the list. And that's all I wanted to do, because when I first when I first started working, you know, and I said this in another interview, I, I worked with all I worked with all black girls. You know, I was doing, you know, Monica and Brandy and, and Tamar and lot, and I was making money and I thought it was such a good thing. And I went to an agency and they looked at my book and my clients and they and they made me feel like shit. So I so I was like, okay, and I told Tam, I, I said, I can't dress any more black girls. I was like, they're gonna put me in a box and I'm never gonna be able to get out of it. I can't dress any more black girls. So I literally went from making $10,000 a day to $750 a day. Working with the white girl. To work with the white girl. Yeah. But unfortunately, in the world we live in and the landscape of our business, I had to make that sacrifice. Yeah, because fashion is controlled by white Europeans. Right, and then, but then I worked and worked and worked and now and then I got to a place I could work with whoever I wanted to. I got a call from the city girls and my agent told them no. And then I found out, I said, are you fucking crazy? Yeah. I'm dressed in the city girls. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I got to the point where I could do whatever I wanted to do. I dress Lil Durk, you know what I mean? Like you can't tell me yeah. that I can't dress Anne Hathaway and Lil Durk at the same time. Right. 
You know what I mean? Like, you can't tell it's me that. Because given ambidextrous, babe. But I had to work. I had to hustle the way to make people respect me and my work that so that I can do that. And now the people come behind me have an easier way yeah. because now they have a reference point. They can say, oh, well, Law did that, and Law made this amount of money. And I'm the, Colin will tell you, I'm the type of person you could call me like, oh, well, somebody called me. How much was you getting? I'm like, well, I was getting 10. You try to get 20. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if... They double back. I was like, well, I know you gave Colin 20, so now I want 30. You know what I mean? And that's the way we should be with each other because that's the way we used to be with each other. Right. Ooh. Yeah. I'm going to lean right into this next question, if that's okay. So, Law, at this point, you've been recognized as one of Time 100's most influential people, the Hollywood Reporter's most powerful stylist, Two years in a row. Not one, but the two. I just want to know how it feels when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you have to fight the urge to say, wow, these other bitches aren't even close. <laughs> I, I do say that all the time, but I say, <laughs> but I also say, you know, I definitely talk my shit, but I also say that, 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 that those doors are open so that Colin Carter and Timothy Lou Garcia and all the other people that I mentor that's coming behind me have an easier way to get to those places. Colin celebrated his cover of Hollywood Reporter this year. Make some noise. Um, you. you know, but I was the first black person on that cover. And more than anything, the, the awards and everything feel good, but it's like, it's part of the legacy that will help other people. And that's why I am in with my life. Like, my career and what I do isn't for me anymore. It's for everybody else that could benefit from it. Because who could outdo the doer? I mean, I mean, now we can really talk, we can really talk some shit. I like, mean, you know, I just <laughs> getting back to you, Colin, and just coming up underneath this wing, you've also been such an advocate of black social issues. You've been such a supporter. I mean, both of you have, but just so vocal about supporting black designers and prioritizing them. I really want to know how that activism affects your approach to your work or if it has, you know, I know that it shapes your perspective a lot because you're a black man dealing with a lot of clients and women who are black women, but does it affect you in a negative way also? Like, is there ever any situation where like, people try you because of how vocal you are about the issues you support? I don't think people try me because of how vocal I am. I think that um, for me, the way that it affects my approach to fashion is that I don't, I don't beg. Like I go where I'm welcome, I go where I'm loved, I go where I'm respected, but I'll play into the politics up until a point to where it starts to affect who I am morally and affect my integrity, so for me, I don't, I don't really believe in begging. I feel like if, if the seat is for you at the table, it'll be for you. Um, there's a lot of doors that got, you know, closed in my face and, you know, I could have took it personal and, you know, I decided not to and I decided to work harder and those doors reopened, hence the cover of the Hollywood Reporter, you know? That was a no for like years, you know? So I think that for me, um, I do feel like people know me to speak out against certain things, so I feel like they handle me a little more gently or their responses are a little different. Um, but I don't think it affects me in, I don't, think, I don't feel like it affects me in a negative way, yeah. We love to hear that, so thank you. I wanna know if there's any, are there any people who are aspiring designers, stylists, wanna be in fashion, hands up. Hands up high, don't be shy, hands up high. Okay, I just wanna, I just wanna clock that real quick. Okay, love that also, um, because that shows that you putting yourself in a room to learn, and I love when people take that priority in themselves to like be in a space like this. And for those individuals, I think this is a great opportunity for, for the two of you to imagine talking to these young stylists, right? What factors would you advise them to consider when they're trying to create impactful looks? Let me do something first. So um, I recently acquired an a online platform called School of Style. And our goal is to shorten the, the space of, of your dream of being a celebrity stylist um, and, your, and the realization of that dream. So. Our platform is directly tied to an agency where after you complete 
um, the certification, and it's all collegiate level certification. Um, you go into, you can be shifted right into the workforce. There has nothing been, like if you, it's, think about master class for styling, but the difference is with master class, you could take all those classes, it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee you a job. With School of Style, you will be connected and, and have a direct entry into the workforce. So if you are an aspiring stylist, I do ask you to go to schoolofstyle.com and, and, and sign up to get notified because the classes are starting soon. and. We are taking a small cohort because I want to be super involved with the growth and development of people who come and take the classes. So that's just a, another way of me paying it forward and giving back to, to people who want to, you know, hopefully have the type of career that I have. Thank you for that, Law. I think the advice that I would give is just having a strong foundation because a lot of designers think that it's just solely about the aesthetic but the business part isn't handled. You know, I see, uh, um, I know a lot of great designers who are having such a hard time financially, and that's just where we are right now in fashion. But I think that the piece that people don't talk about is investing in your brand and making sure that the business is in order and making sure that the taxes is in order and you have, you know, a great lawyer. And I think that that's the difference between a lot of, you know, new designers that only last a couple years and people that have been around forever, that the business aspect at some point was what it was supposed to be. Thank you for that, Colin. Um, I'm gonna ask to steal an extra five minutes because I know we, we we running close to our time and we're gonna steal some more time real quick because we wanna get outside to some questions, but before we get there, because this conversation is supposed to be about future of fashion, so I wanna make sure I tap this. Um, you know, from social media to artificial intelligence and virtual reality, fashion is involved is always going to evolve with technology. And so I would really love to hear your perspectives on how you see technology shaping the future of the fashion industry. Like, you know, when we look at what Hanifa did with her 3D fashion show, like that was amazing. We saw what Jacques Mousse did with his 3D um, accessory campaign, how amazing that was. Even, I don't know if the girls are into Roblox, but Dress to Impress is really doing something for the young girls. Um, give it up for Dress to Impress. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but my niece got me into it and it's lit. Um, and so I would love for y'all to just chat about how you feel technology um, helps or even hurts the industry. Anybody? I definitely feel like it hurts the industry. Ooh, give me yeah, that. Yeah, I do. I feel like it hurts the industry. I feel like there, there are a lot of jobs that are being taken up by computers. I was just looking at this study where, you know, you can go, you can use apps to shop online and you could even fit virtually. Like you could take a photo of yourself and fit virtually. And I think while it's great, I think that as stylists, you should really focus on bringing more than that to the table than just clothes, you know, making every moment an experience and making sure that you're giving your clients something that they can't get through an app, you know? But I feel like right now where we are in fashion, people are losing their jobs and I think that they will continue to, but you gotta do something that sets yourself aside or invest in one of these companies that are becoming, you know, virtual companies. I think, know? I think it's, it's definitely gonna be, technology is always a competitor of every single industry. I don't think it's just fashion, it changes everything. Even in music, you know how we've seen streaming change everything and how DJs have, be, their work has become digitized in so many ways and so like technology is always a competitor. But then the human element never goes away. It's more about how do we innovate our own perspectives that a computer could never. And so that really, Therein lies the challenge because computers amass so much information. You know, no one in here is a robot, but um, then it turns into what's your technical skill look like? What's your experience look like? Um, La, do you have anything on this convo? Yeah, it's all gonna be on, explained on schoolofstyle.com. And period. <laughs> so sign up for the class, ladies and gents. Um, I think as far as like, even getting into the social media of it all, I think people depend on it so much right now, but that's a landscape that changes almost, what, every five to seven to 10 years of how a platform will flip and shift. Um, how, give me your perspectives on how best or not to rely on social media. Well, for, for stylists, social media became our portfolios years ago. Um, to be honest, maybe 60% of my clients came from, you know, just interactions on social media. Um, and also in just the world of um, 
it make the world smaller, right? So you can have a conversation with a designer in Mumbai or Japan, you know, in a split second. Um, so as a stylist, it's, it's super beneficial. Um, but I just think the, the, the negative part about it, which we all know now is, you can't compare your process and your growth to somebody else's just because what you, of what you see on social media because we are all our best selves on there, right? And it's, a lot of it is just not real. Um, but it's there are there are what great, to share and not to share. There's great benefits on, on social media, but it's it's a double edged sword because I, you know I, I came in in a way in a way that before the influence, like I really worked really hard, and then you see people that get these amazing opportunities because they just consistently do the same thing over and over again. But then you also want to be happy for them because that too is a job. So I, I, for me, it's 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 really I'm really torn with 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 that. My thing that with question. social media, it is a tool. Because for many who didn't have a platform, you can now create your own. And so in that way, it is amazing. I think in another way, people don't always know what not to share, to overshare, or to share too early or too soon. And that sometimes you put something out into the world and then you upset because the people that ran with it, it's like you put it out here. So you have to be mindful in that way. Um, I think that <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that happens, right? And then you're looking around like, damn, you know? But the the smartest, you know, way to go up, wait, Law, tell me what's going on. Oh, no, because some shit just happened with me and, 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 and I feel like you're talking about it, but I'm, I'm really not, not I swear, because it, no, just, just, it happens so much. Uh, yeah, social media is a piece Child, of shit. It happens it's so much. It's a piece of shit sometimes, but you know, it is what it is. I find myself on projects I'm working on, like, damn, I would love to share this little piece of something. But then I'm like, nah, 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 because I know how the people do. So let me take a beat and be patient, even though I'm excited or whatever it is, because it's happened to me too. And so I think it's, it's a thing that's rampant in general. You know, when you have a good idea, you need to work that thing through till it's ready, bake that thing. And then when it's ready, then you put it out into the world. I think that's the, that's the one mindful thing I would tell people about social media. As far as like technical skills and learnings and stuff, you, can, you don't have to come through the pipelines of these institutions. Like we are all examples of people who've probably deviated from those systems. But what you can do is look at what those systems are teaching and then extract the pieces that you wanna learn. You know, like you can take a class somewhere, you can get a certification if you really wanna learn a thing like 3D animating or 3D designing because that's a big thing in fashion design right now, like your ability to digitize your work and how you innovate that digitizing of the work. And so I would encourage people who are interested in those things to still learn about them, but you don't have to take the traditional route into your learning about them. Um, moving is still in this lane of future fashion, um, forecasting. I think it's a funny thing that people think they know how to do, but don't always across industries in general. And something that I thought was interesting just in the 15 years that I've watched streetwear change and develop and how it ultimately has become luxury. Is there a genre, subgenre, any niche that you all forecast of being like, oh, this is it, or this is gonna be the next thing, or the girls should pay attention to this? I mean, you can answer that because I'm, I'm just in a different space in my career, in my life. Like, I'm not even thinking about stuff like that. I'm thinking about ways to benefit and be, to be of service to people in a different type of way um, because I've been in service to my clients and, and that industry for so long. So I kind of, I kind of, I'm, I'm in a, I'm just in a whole different space, um, to be quite honest. I love that. So I'm going to let Colin take it. I don't feel like I've ever fashion forecasted. I feel like people make it such a thing to mm -hmm. predict what's coming, but I feel like when you know what you're doing, whatever you do is going to be timeless, you know? Period. Yeah. Well, Real I will say things to used to come back every 20 years, but now the cycle has shortened. Yeah, it's sort of, because it was like, you know, like 70s used to come, like 70s came back in, you know, in the early 2000s came back. Now the, the cycle for that is really short because I think what it is is that people are trying constantly trying to create content and, 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 it's, and it's driving the market to, um, to just to regurgitate things that have happened in the past at a quicker level. Amazing, those are great answers. Thank you both. I wanna open up the floor before we completely run out of time. Yes, so I wanna, I wanna take wanna five to minutes before questions. Thank y'all for y'all's work. But also, how important has representation been to you in getting to where you are, but also making sure you're opening space for other people coming after you? It's, it's, it's the only thing that's important to me right now. The only thing. Thank you, Law. As a fashion designer and a wardrobe stylist, how do I know what to charge? First, you have to know your worth 
first of all, but you also have to be realistic and engage that based on your experience, right? You, you, you don't wanna be, I also tell a story about um, the $75 girl, but if you read my book, then you'll understand that story. You don't wanna limit, because every opportunity ain't a great opportunity, and people gonna come and say, oh, this could be a great opportunity for you, so you gotta, you gotta understand what, which are the best opportunities Know your worth, but also know your worth and your value, but also be realistic with that because you can always raise your prices once you get more experience. Right. You really have to charge like for the level you're at, for the level that you're at. I feel like a lot of people charge based off of things that they've heard other people charge, but it's just like for the level of your experience and the service that you're bringing to the table. You know, your 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 payment should be you know accurate. It to should that. match. Yeah, it should match. Thank you both. What's your question? I'm Arius Ane. I also go to Clark Atlanta, fashion design major. My question for you two is, considering how confident you are and how self-aware you are, and what experiences did you have where you were challenged in spaces where it was intimidating, and how did you move forward from delegating those spaces? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what, to be quite honest, I've always been so sure of who I am that I never really walked into a space that I felt um, that I didn't belong. I had people trying to make me feel like I didn't belong. Even when I started working with Celine Dion, something that was so big that nobody ever expected. When I walked into it and sat down with her, you know, my confidence is what landed me the job, you know? And so you have to, you have to really believe in yourself. And you can also buy my book because I teach a lot of lessons about that in the book. But seriously, um, it's, it's, all, it's all about confidence and, and not letting people make you feel like you don't belong. When, what advice do you have for, um, you know, like an upcoming stylist? You, you, first of all, you have, to know who, you have to know what type of stylist you wanna be. There's a population in Atlanta, right? And if that's, if that's what you're going after, if you wanna work with athletes and rappers and reality stars, then you're in a good place. But if you wanna work with Hollywood and A-list actresses, then it's not the place for you, right? So you have to figure out what you want your career to look like and go to those places, right? I think what sometimes people get so caught up being a big fish in a small pond and are intimidated to go where the money is, but you're never gonna win the game if you're not in the stadium. So figure out exactly who you want to be, what's your career, what you want your career to be, and go where that to make that possible. Because industries live in certain cities, yeah. right, in certain That's markets, and so Atlanta definitely has a lot of opportunity where you can get started, but you know you're not gonna be able to stay. You're gonna have to go somewhere else to get to the level that we're talking about. And so you know you can absolutely get started in this city because there's a lot of opportunity here. But what law well, is saying wanna, is like, yeah, but she might want to be this. Might you might want to be, be, be market, here. right? You know what yeah, I mean? I moved here for the opportunity because St. Louis it really didn't have that much opportunity as far as styling. So I moved to Atlanta, and it has like a lot. But of just be clear on your goals on and what type of stylist you want to be. Amazing. Thank you, sweetheart. Last question. Um, first, I want to say hi and thank you to Law. I've been wearing So Kate since I was like 14. I really appreciate Listen. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, my name is Chanel Michelle. I, I just graduated from Florida AM and you told me. Hey. <laughs> but you said that style is instinctual. I, I thought I've always loved style, I thought I always understood style. I see you too, and I understand I know not shit. Um, I, I'm a student at heart, so I mean, I went to fam, uh, I, I went to fam and I like, I wanna learn how to style better and I heard you're about your school, but I, I heard that styling is in person. Like you have yeah, yeah, to yeah. be on set to understand how to do it in No, it's two different things right there, style and that's fashion. Fashion okay. is a business. Style is what you're born with, okay. right? And so you have, to, you have to be able to distinguish the two. You can always learn fashion. You can always learn the industry. You can always learn the right things to do on set. You can always learn the etiquette to be with your clients and what to say and what not to say. You know, when to push them, when not to push them. Those, those things can be learned. The style is what you're born with, right? The, the, How do you know the, that you have it? You, you have it and it's, the, it's the, the ability to think on your feet and you know and to, to, to take the nonverbal cues from what you you know watch people and watch the room. you know those, those are more the things that you are born with, right? Everything else can be learned and then you have to love it. Like people think this job is so this is one of the most demanding, hard, stressful jobs in the world and, and often thankless. 
and people look at you as you, you have to know that you're disposable. Every time you're in a, in a situation, you have to understand that you are disposable, like the trash, and you have to be okay with that. Because it's true, and the people, and, and they're gonna make you feel that way. Um, so, so, so yeah, but you, you have to really love it and dedicate your life to it, and, and really, you can't do it half ass You can't be like, oh, I'm a stylist, but I'm also a model and a creative director. Pick, a, pick something. You count on like one hand how many black people in fashion we could look up to. So I just want to say thank you, give your flowers while we're here. Now, considering everything that y'all have accomplished, of course, what y'all went through have made y'all the people that y'all are today. But knowing what you know now, what would you feel like you would have done differently knowing everything that you've experienced and done up until this point? For me, I, I've never had the opportunity to just intern or assist anyone. I would have loved to have that opportunity because when I started my career, I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't have an infrastructure or, so I, I learned, like I literally built the plane while I was flying it, right? And it just happened to work out, but I would have loved to really had a mentor or someone to kind of give me at least some, some type of advice and, 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 and keep me from making so many mistakes. You know, when we get money and we obtain a certain level of success, the first thing we want to do is everything that we couldn't do when we didn't have money. But I think one of the first things you need to do is really, like I said, invest in your business, get your taxes, you know, your, your team, you know, the team that you build around you because there was a point where I felt like I was saving money by working with people who weren't overqualified, but I ended up having to double that to make up for the money that I lost and also pay people who were qualified for the job. So I think one of the biggest things is just investing in yourself, making sure you pay your taxes. <laughs> that first year, I thought I was balling and I spent two years almost trying to recover, you know? And that's how it is, you know, especially in America when, when your taxes is what it is. So just getting your infrastructure and your foundation together is. I did the same thing him. I didn't, ha I didn't have anything. So once I started making money, I wanted to go buy Birkins and teeth and all that shit. <laughs> and then I owed the government $60,000 in taxes. And then I went to the ATM one day and I didn't have any money. So, but that's, that's really, what he's saying is really, really important. You have to look at it as a business. Styling is a business, it's not a hobby. Yeah, there's a lot of independent accounting systems you can use. Like, there's so many. There's ones that are paid subscriptions. There's ones that are free that you can just start that even help you file your taxes. One of them that I will give you is that Intuit QuickBooks. You can invoice, track everything. It connects everything so that you're not fucking your money up because that's, like, the worst thing you could do to yourself. And so I would advise you to just start aligning with those when you're just starting out eventually. Because you think you make 100000 but you really you only really made not. 47 Yeah. But you spend it like you made 100 Right. And so the check might look good, but after it clears the expenses, the taxes and everything, it's, it might not be very much. And so I would advise you to get acquainted with like an independent accounting system that's like not that expensive and not that hard to manage by yourself. Um, I'm sorry, y'all. I wish we had 30 more minutes, but we do not. We are over time. And so I just want to thank everybody for hanging out with us. Give it up, please, for Law Roach and Colin Carter one more time. 